My name is David Fifield, and I'm with Tor. And um, these are some of the other people who have helped to make what I'm going to talk about today a reality. Um, we published a research paper. Uh, a lot of the ideas then I'm going to make more concrete today, because now we have the system that's been deployed and running in operation. We have lots of lessons learned, and I want to share some of them with you. Also, I'm the lead developer of this system, but I'm not the only developer. In fact, there are quite a lot of people involved with it now. It's turning into a nice little project. Um, most of these people are affiliated with the Tor project. I want to give a special shout out um, to Alexandre Allaire, who is uh, a new developer, also a student, really good hacker, who's been doing a lot of good work for Flash Proxy and has gotten a lot of things done that wouldn't have gotten done without him. Some of these other people I'll also mention on, uh, later on in the talk. My second card says, apologize for the name. Sorry. <laughs> Flash Proxies is a bad name because it immediately gives everybody the completely wrong idea. Everybody looks at Flash Proxies and they think Adobe Flash. And it's just not the case because our Flash Proxies are written in JavaScript and use WebSockets. I'll let you in on the secret. The reason it's called Flash Proxy, though, is because we originally implemented it in Adobe Flash. Um, we were young, we didn't know any better back then. Uh, but part of the situation is that back then, WebSocket was not as mature as it is today. And it really wouldn't have worked for what we were doing. We needed to find a way to get access to sockets from within a web browser, and back then, Flash was the way to go. Since then, everybody knows Adobe Flash is proprietary bugware full of exploits that nobody should be running at all. So we ported the whole thing from Flash to JavaScript when that became possible. And we've been completely JavaScript for a long time now. These Flash proxies run in all modern web browsers. So basically, it's a JavaScript program that runs a proxy inside a web browser for the purposes of censorship circumvention. The way it looks for you as a website owner is you copy and paste some HTML into your web pages. And that's all you have to do. The viewers of your web pages see this. And what it turns into is this little badge here that says Internet Freedom. As long as you're viewing this page, this is actually a running program. This is um, a flash proxy. You're eligible to be proxying connections from censored Internet users as long as you're viewing the page that has this badge on it. One of the things we leverage in the flash proxy system is that our characteristics of flash proxies are very similar to characteristics of the web as a whole. That is, flash proxies are very numerous. They're ephemeral. They come and go all the time. The idea behind this is it becomes hard to build a blacklist of them and prevent access to them, which is what we're going for. The next slide says, define the problem. Before I do that, I want to step back a little bit and give you a bit more perspective on where Tor fits into this whole circumvention landscape. So a lot of people know that Tor is an anonymity network. So for example, you use Tor, your ISP can't tell what websites you're going to. Websites you visit can't tell it's you visiting them. And your traffic is unlinkable across different sessions. Those are some of the security guarantees you're looking for. But more and more, Tor is being used these days for circumvention. So you're in a country that censors its internet. You can't get to all the websites you want to. A lot of people use Tor because it gives you good security guarantees and it helps you get around these kinds of national firewalls. So let's say you're a censor. You want to block an IP address. You want to block a website. Really, you have two problems. First problem is block that website. Second problem is you have to block Tor and VPNs and open proxies and every other way that people can use to get around your first block. So censors who are interested in blocking access to websites, they block access to websites. And then they also block all the entry points into Tor, among other things. This is one of the big problems that people have with using Tor for circumvention. And this is what we hope to add. To, this is what we hope to address. In my view, there are really two like, primary axes that network censorship works on. The first is censorship by address. The censor sees a website and says, this is a bad website. We're just going to block all traffic to and from this domain, no questions asked, regardless of the content. It's going to run a packet filter on its firewall that looks for certain IP addresses and just drops that traffic on the floor, for example. This is one way to um, do censorship. And this is what we hope to address with Flash Proxy. Another way censors work is censoring by content. So for example, you may want to say your users should have access to a wide variety of domains, but you don't want them to say certain things. So you search the traffic for keywords, for example. You can do more sophisticated things, like look at 
mm, packet size distribution and timing, try to classify different traffic flows into categories and make the decision whether to block or not to block. This is something we don't claim to address with Flash Proxy on its own. Um, really, to succeed against a sufficiently savvy sensor, you need to do both. Because obviously, a sensor isn't going to limit itself. It's going to use all the technology um, that's affordable and available to it. So really, you have to combine these two things. This is something we haven't done yet, but it's something we're actively working towards and something that I think is definitely possible. For the rest of this talk, though, our threat model is our sensor can look at IP addresses and um, look at destinations and block traffic on those bases, and it doesn't do any further traffic sniffing. Question? Yeah, question. Hasn't anybody gone to a, a whitelist approach instead of a blacklist approach? This is a good question. Because there's only a thousand places worth going to. Right, <laughs> so the question is, has anyone gone to a whitelist approach instead of a blacklist approach? To my knowledge, and I'm not an expert at this, no, except for maybe places like North Korea, where you, know, you can hardly say the internet even exists. Um, of course, something like this is completely defeated by a whitelist approach. Almost everything is defeated by a whitelist approach. Um, that is also a topic of act active research. So again, here we're assuming a blacklist. If there's something that the sensor doesn't have a reason to block, it's not blocked yet. But they could block it in the future if they find out it's being used for circumvention. Next card, draw an architecture diagram. This is a picture you've seen if you've ever been to our Flash Proxy demo page um, in the Stanford uh, Applied Crypto Group. But what I would like to do is take a little bit of time to draw it out for you again on the board. I think it's easier to understand if you see the pieces come into place when they're needed and you see how all the parts fit together. But something that's crucial to understanding of the whole system is this limitation of WebSocket technology and basically any web technology. It's that a web browser can't receive connections. Normally when you think of a proxy, you think of a server out on the internet that's sitting there waiting for connections. It receives an, a connection and then does something with it. It's something you just can't do with a web browser. There's no WebSocket.listen call. So we have to invert the proxy model. We have the proxy instead connect to the client. That raises the difficulty of how does the proxy know where to connect to, and that's what I'll hope to um, explain with this diagram. So this is our basic model. We have a client here. The client wants access to a Tor relay. Now the client may not actually want to access a Tor relay. We're using Tor as a proxy to the wider internet. But basically, if you can get to Tor, you win, because then you can get to see the sites you want. And we also rely on Tor for various other security properties. So we're using this as a proxy for the internet, the free internet in general. And this is the sensor firewall. And again, this sensor has the power to look at your source and destination and block traffic um, based on those criteria. And of course, obviously, this is one of the addresses that the sensor is going to block. So there's absolutely no way we can communicate directly with this Tor relay. Now, I mentioned the difficulty is that we somehow need to get this client's address out in order that a flash proxy, a browser-based proxy, can learn that address and connect back to make this proxy connection. So we have a piece in the middle. Basically, whenever someone shows you their uh, internet circumvention scheme, it's going to be a lot of variations on drawing different ways to draw a triangle on a blackboard. So here's our triangle. We call this piece the facilitator. So step one in this whole diagram is the client sends its address to the facilitator. Wait, 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 wait. Right, exactly, good. <laughs> this should make people angry because here we're sending something through the firewall to the facilitator. This is presumably at a fixed IP address. It is. It's presumably blocked by the sensor. It is. And there's no way we can actually do this. So the way we get around this restriction is we make this line kind of wavy. What we actually do is something special. This is a special step that we call rendezvous. And rendezvous is basically any mechanism by which clients and bridges learn about each other. So I'm going to return to this because this bears a discussion of its own, how this first step works. But until I get there, that'll be the next slide, I want you to think about how you could make this work 
knowing that you have very relaxed restrictions on how this communication works. So this communication can be very low bandwidth. All you're sending is like a dozen bytes. It's an IP address, right? It can be uh, very high latency. This communication can take on the order of minutes. And it's write only. You never have to read anything back from the facilitator. So think about ways that you can make this work in a covert, unblockable way without communicating directly with this IP address. And then I'll come back and tell you how we do this uh, in reality. So this is step one. Client registers this address with the facilitator. You start up your tour. This happens automatically. Now a flash proxy comes online. What this means in concrete terms is someone opened their web browser and they're now looking at a page that has this proxy badge on it. So there's nothing special happening here. The JavaScript program starts running and the first thing it does is it contacts the facilitator and says, do you have any clients for me? The facilitator says, well, yes, I have a client address for you and sends it back. Actually, more often than not, the facilitator says, sorry, I have no clients for you. That's because we have many, many more proxies than we do clients, which is actually a good thing because it helps some of our security claims. But for now, let's assume that the facilitator had a client address to give the proxy, and the proxy picked it up. At this point, there's only one thing to do. The proxy connects uh, to the client. Technically, it's connecting to a separate program on the client, uh, which is called the transport plugin. This is part of Tor's infrastructure of pluggable transports. It means there can be a program separate from Tor in a separate address space that knows how to talk all these exotic transports. And Tor itself, the program, doesn't need to know how to do all of these. So there's this whole infrastructure in place. It forks a program and does all of this. So this separate little program is sitting there waiting to receive WebSocket connection. And again, this happens all automatically when you start your Tor. Now here's another arrow that's going through the firewall. So we should look at that and see, why does this arrow work? The reason why we claim this works is that this connection is coming from an IP address that the sensor has never seen before. And the sensor has no reason to block this. This is just a random home internet user, business internet user. This could be the middle of an Apple store or something like that. So this is not going to be on any uh, sensor blacklist. Now that's maybe too strong an assumption because you think about this, obviously there's some things a sensor can do. Maybe it's weird for um, people in your country to be receiving a lot of connections from residential DSL addresses. For example, you could try blocking things like that. You could block everything not addressed to an official server. Yeah, you could block anything. You could say, okay, nobody in this country gets to run servers, for example. On the other hand, this sort of technology Peer-to-peer -peer connections between browsers is only becoming more and more common. WebSocket is becoming quite common and quite well supported. Another technology, which I want to talk a little bit more about, is WebRTC, again, becoming more and more common. So maybe this kind of connection is not so weird these days. We're only a couple of months into like real practical deployment of the system. So these are lessons that we're still learning. But this is why we claim um, this connection can work. Uh, so this is four. And five, finally, obviously, there's another transport plugin running on the Tor relay. The flash proxy connects to Tor and then does nothing but sit there and copy bytes back and forth. And that's the rest of its existence. Now what happens when this flash proxy disappears? Because remember, this is just a program running in a tab in a web browser. We expect them to not last forever. Well, of course, your Tor circuit dies. You have to build a new circuit. You have to reestablish a new connection with a new proxy. But we designed the system for this, and it works quite well. What really happens when you give your address to the facilitator is it's going to give that address to multiple proxies. And all of those are going to connect to you. It's like five proxies. So you're going to have like five live connections at a time. But you're only going to use one at a time. When that one dies, you're going to have these other connections already. TCP handshake is completed. Everything is ready to go. You just jump onto that and go. So unfortunately, your TCP connection dies, but um, your overall you know, Tor experience keeps going. When we were designing this, we were thinking, you know, browsers, web browsers, they're changing pages all the time. These proxies are going to be dying and coming back like every 30 seconds. So we really designed around that. We did a lot of really stringent tests, performance tests, to make sure we would work in that scenario. And we do. We had a big um, mean test where we had a proxy die every 10 seconds and try to download a large file through that. And it's slow, but you can still get it done. 
What we have found since then, though, is that the real world isn't as harsh as our expectations. People these days leave browser tabs open for a long time. It's not unusual to see a flash proxy live for days and days, um, especially because we're not relying just on random web users anymore. It has become surprisingly, at least to me, surprisingly common for people to find these flash proxies and just park a tab on that web page and then go do all their w other web browsing. They just feel good about contributing to the circumvention network. So those proxies you expect to last you know, just a long, long time. The facilitator doesn't know when any of these connections get broken or anything? Right. The facilitator does not know when these connections get broken. Um, so if I there, is, there is a little bit of feedback, but I have to say this is not all implemented yet. What we can do, for example, is proxies can report to the facilitator and say, I'm serving these particular clients. And then that gives the facilitator knowledge of, OK, this client needs more service because it just lost a proxy. We want to maintain that certain level of proxy service that it has, about five. Um, Right now, we don't have that kind of feedback. So what we do in, in practical matters is the client just re-registers itself. It just does that rendezvous step again when it runs out of proxies, which also works pretty well. But we would like to make that more fluid. Good. Let's return to rendezvous. Did anyone think of ways that you could make this happen? This one way, low bandwidth connection. All right, well, when it's we wrote this paper. It's got to be automatic. It's got to be automatic, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be automatic. It depends how dedicated you are to your circumvention. Oh, then Tumblr. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you could make a, bl a blog post or something. You could call your friend in another country and say, here's my IP address. Would you send this to the facilitator for me if a phone works for you, for example? Of course, that's going to work for like one in a million people are going to go to the trouble of doing that. So we try to do something more automatic. But that's the right kind of idea. The nice thing about rendezvous step, it's really nice to find yourself on this side of the thread equation for once. Usually white hats, we're looking at you have to patch all the holes or else the bad guy wins. This is a case where we can try 10 different rendezvous methods. The sensor can block nine of them. And if one of them gets through, we win. So for once, the, the odds are in our favor. Um, these are the relaxed restrictions that we have that actually make rendezvous possible. And you may ask, if we had this magical, unblockable covert channel, well, why don't we just use that? And the answer to that, of course, is you can do some things for rendezvous that you couldn't do um, for normal bidirectional transport. You couldn't browse the web over a rendezvous channel. You couldn't do IRC or email or anything like that. So this is what we have implemented. We use a system based on email. And this is one of possible systems. We actually have another one in the works and another that are still only ideas at this point. When we originally wrote the paper, we just said, you know, there's all these things you can do. Um, we haven't really done any of them yet. But uh, it's nice to have one that we actually have deployed and is being used on a daily basis. The way this works is you take your IP address, you encrypt it with the facilitator's public key, and then you send it to a distinguished Gmail address. So if you can connect to Gmail's SMTP port, you make an SSL connection on that, you send this email. It doesn't come from your real email address, because obviously that's bad for anonymity. It comes from a fake address, and it goes to this distinguished email address that we control. Then we have a process running on the facilitator that periodically pulls this email box. It gets those messages, it decrypts them, and then it puts them in the queue to be handed out to proxies. And this works really well. As long as you can send email to a Gmail address, um, you can do rendezvous using this system. Now, countries have been known to block Gmail. So again, we're working on other systems that can work. And again, you only need one of them to work. But another thing about well, this, yeah. When I open an SMTP connection, somebody in the middle knows my IP address right? as part of the TCP handshake. So the fact that I don't stick my email address in it means nothing. That's true. So he's saying that when you're connecting this, you're revealing to the sensor your IP address. And it may not immediately declare that you're using this rendezvous method, but probably they can figure that out just based on the characteristics of our program, the particular way it talks SMTP or whatever. Yeah. There are probably ways to figure that out. Well, plus, most people don't, uh, I, actually I don't know about this, is, 
do most people run SMTP from their computer or do they run it to their ISP and then the ISP sends the mail for them? Right, that's another good question. So I can tell you he's saying most people um, don't actually connect directly to Gmail's SMTP server. They go through their ISP and then it goes through something else. So that may be true. So what I can tell you is that in practice, okay. this technique has been working so far. There probably are ways to block it. But again, we also have some other ideas coming down the line. Um, sorry, one, one thing. Another thing to think about is that even if the sensor does block Gmail, that has this high cost, a high societal and economic cost to the sensor. So this is another way that we win the censorship arms race, is by making the cost of censorship so high that it can't be borne by the sensor anymore. So anything that we can do to push um, a little further towards that goal is actually helpful for human rights. Yes, sir. I'm curious how mobile would play in this, this game. What do you mean? For example, accessing Tor on your mobile phone? Or using cellular networks or you know, other ways of putting facilitators and components in different places. Sure, that's a good idea. Um, what about using mobile frequencies or cell phone frequencies? You can imagine, for example, sending an SMS doing Sorry, the same text. sort of thing. Yeah, sending a text message, and then the facilitator comes and picks that up. And if we could probably um, layer some crypto on that just to make it non-trivial for addresses to be picked out of there. Even though our client addresses are not really something we're trying hard to protect because even if the sensor were not blocking your access to Tor, you give up your address just by connecting through the firewall to a Tor relay. So that's really something outside of our threat model. We're not trying to hide these addresses from the sensor because we figured the sensor would be getting those anyway um, using Tor normally. Cool, so yeah, this works and um, uh, it's what we're running now. All right, so challenges in this model. The big elephant in the room that we talk about constantly is the fact that the sensor client has to be able to receive a TCP connection. Now, approximately 100% of <coughs> clients on the internet are behind some kind of NAT these days. So that makes it non-trivial. Even if you're in the position where you own your router and you're able to configure port forwarding to get through your NAT, a lot of users don't have the technical knowledge to be able to do that. So this is cutting the number of people we can help way, way, way down. And we understand that. We've been living with it so far just because there aren't easy, expedient solutions um, to this problem. But, yes, sir? I thought there was a, uh, a loophole for this that the gamers needed. Where you so just it with the, the router and everybody implemented it just so the gamers could have their, their fun. Yes, this is true. So there are some protocols. There's one called NatPMP and also um, UPNP, Universal Plug and Play, can do this. Um, and this is actually also built into some of the Tor software to automatically open a port for you. Unfortunately, it's not well integrated with the flash proxy model yet. But yes, there is a way, if you have a router that you, can, you control, to automatically have it open a port for you. So if that works for you, that's awesome. That, that's great. I think still there are a lot of users we're not helping that we could help if we could just get over this um, boundary. So we have some, t some hope for we have some hope for future web technologies. One in particular is called WebRTC, which is something being developed, I think, mainly by Google and Mozilla and uh, the W3C to allow, basically, they envision audio video chat between browsers as a peer connection. And this has NAT traversal built in. It's based on UDP, and it's designed for a reality that everybody is behind NATs. Now, of course, if we can have a reliable data transfer on top of this UDP-based channel, we can use this as um, in place of WebSocket and get around these NATs automatically. This would be a really nice place to be. There's a fellow named Chris Ball who is checking this stuff out um, regarding WebRTC, and he says it's not quite there yet. Um, it was only a few weeks ago that Chrome and Firefox made their first WebRTC connection and had this video chat going between them. So this is very new technology, but I have a lot of hope for it. That said, I can't resist the temptation to do demo for you using flash proxies. Now, UPnP, NAT PMP is nice when you control the router. There are a lot of situations where you don't control the router. You're at an internet cafe. You're at a university. Here, we're behind NAT. 
And um, obviously, this connection shouldn't work. So let me show you a little bit of what's going on here. I'm looking at the raw logs from our transport plugin program. And what we see here is that it started up. It got a command to register this address. And we have registered this address with Gmail. Now the trick we're using here, does anyone recognize this address format? It's IPv6, but other than that, I can't tell. Yeah, this is an IPv6 format. So turns out Teredo IPv6 tunneling gets through NATS. So this is one of the ways we get around this problem. If you have an IPv6 tunnel, a lot of times this will work for you. This is one of the recommended configurations. Now the way this happens is you send an email, and then there's a process that checks it every minute. So you usually have to wait about 30 seconds or up to a minute, or sometimes a bit longer, because there aren't that many IPv6 flash proxies out there. They're fewer comparatively than IPv4. So we'll let this run for a bit and then see if it comes up. But if it comes up, this is us connecting to a Tor relay without ever connecting directly to that Tor relay through some random web browser out on the internet that we've never met before. Ah, there it is. Did you see that? Remote WebSocket connection from Scrubbed. We, by default, scrub all IP addresses from the logs just for safety and hygiene reasons. And there we go. We're configured to use Tor. And we need to upgrade our Tor browser bundle because I haven't done that in a little while. But there you go. This is um, a live demo of actually using flash proxies to connect to the internet and also working through NAT, just to show you that there are situations when it can work, even in a network you don't control. So we've been keeping logs in the facilitator. Again, we don't log IP addresses, but we do log whenever a client registers an address and we log it with a timestamp. And we log with a timestamp whenever a proxy requests a client address. And this is a graph of what has been um, the number of proxy requests we received since about September of last year. So you can see these days, it's pretty amazing. We're getting something like 10,000, 20,000 proxy requests a day. We're getting pretty good proxy capacity. Uh, looking at this graph, there's something that immediately jumps out at you. What happens at the end of December last year? Something happens. In this case, it's no mystery what went on. There was a conference. There's an annual conference in Germany called the Chaos Communications Congress. And Flash Proxy got mentioned in a talk by um, Roger Dingledine and Jacob Applebaum, who are people involved with Tor, and a lot of people came to this talk. Uh, let me play this little clip of their talk for you. Flash proxy is another approach here. So the idea is you basically put this little badge on your website, and then anybody who shows up to your website is given this Ajax script, which turns them into a Tor bridge. So it turns their Firefox browser into a volunteer, <laughs> bridging. So people seemed to like the idea. And it got a lot of attention after that. People were talking about it. It made some news sites. People were talking about it on Twitter. And I mean, you see the effects here. It was just a huge explosion in proxy capacity. What this means concretely is that people were putting it on their web pages, and then viewers of those web pages were seeing those and becoming proxies. OK, so that's the number of proxy requests we get over time. There's another similar graph of the number of client registrations we receive over time. Again, you see something pretty flat characteristics starting in September of last year when we started keeping these logs. You'll notice there's this plateau at like 48. I have a strong suspicion that that's because I have a cron job running every 30 minutes that tries to download something through the flash proxy network. So a lot of days, my cron job was the only thing that was using the network. But you see, we start to get a little bit um, of a hump at the beginning of December. And then obviously, something happens in the middle of January this year. And all of a sudden, we're getting huge numbers of requests. Not huge, but you can see the numbers here. It goes up to like about 1,000 um, per day. What happened in the middle of January is we made Tor browser bundles that included Flash Proxy and another circumvention system called Ops Proxy, both installed and both enabled by default. Now, Ops Proxy is a little bit older than Flash Proxy. 
And it, it's designed to counter the other axis of censorship, which is the traffic sniffing problem. What Office Proxy basically does is it runs all your bytes through a cipher, so it looks like, to an eavesdropper, just random bytes. Now, random bytes on its own may be suspicious, but it's also a lot harder to design, for example, a firewall to block random bytes than it is to make a firewall drop certain you know, pattern matches. Um, yes, that's true. So yeah, it's very interesting. So our flash proxy doesn't work when people are looking at these WebSocket connections, because you can see the data inside that and say, this looks like a Tor connection, because Tor has some distinctive ter characteristics. Office proxy solves that, but the problem Office proxy has is it only goes to a small number of bridges that support this Office proxy protocol. This, all the sensor has to do is find out what these bridges are, block access to them by address, and it's game over for that. So we released a bundle that has both of these together. Now I should emphasize they're not working together yet. It's just two transports working on their own, and hopefully one of them works for you or the other one works for you. But it's critical that we put this into a browser bundle, which means you download a package and it gives you a web browser already configured to use Tor and configured to be used in a safe manner. And it has these, uh, it has these transports enabled by default. I want to say a little bit about uh, the Tor browser bundle. If you're a Tor user, you definitely should be using the Tor browser bundle instead of, for example, configuring your Safari or even your Firefox to use Tor as a proxy. The reason is there are a lot of application level attacks that can de-anonymize you. There are a lot of nasty things in JavaScript. For example, a website can find out what fonts you have installed. And that's like a fingerprint for you. That can be used to link you between sessions. Tor Browser Bundle, they have thought of an awful lot of situations and attacks like this. And the Browser Bundle is configured to disable those attacks by default. So if you're using Tor, you really should be using the Tor Browser Bundle. And if you're being censored, you should be using this pluggable transports bundle. So that explains this big hump here in the middle of January. But this graph probably, well, certainly overestimates the number of clients we actually have. The reason for that is, as I said, both of these transports are enabled by default. You have a lot of people who are using it just for the ops proxy part, because that works in a lot of countries where they don't actually block traffic to these ops bridges yet. Um, but a lot of people haven't bothered to configure their port forwarding or whatever they need to do to actually make the flash proxy part work. So they're still registering their addresses with the facilitator, but there's no way to actually connect to them. So this represents the number of client registrations, but not necessarily the number of actual Tor connections we had happen. So I have another graph here. This is actually measured at the bridge, the bridge that's speaking WebSocket, measuring the number of connections we get. We see it's quite a bit lower. We're looking at something like 100 to 200 daily connections. But this is a more realistic num uh, estimate of the actual number of clients that we're serving each day. All right, so there are a lot of people who've seen me talk about this idea. And they say, David, I like this flash proxy idea a lot. The only thing that bothers me is you're using these people's network connection without permission. Someone connects to this website, they don't know what this flash proxy badge is doing. All of a sudden, they're carrying Tor traffic. And maybe they don't want to be doing that. Now, this is true. And all I can say with that is, I agree. I would like for us to move to an opt-in model so that everyone who is a flash proxy in the system is someone who has volunteered to do it. So we started, the reason why we're not, I should say, incidentally, is mainly for historical reasons. Um, we didn't picture flash proxies being used in the way that people are tending to use them now. And we have a different idea of the kinds of people who operate these flash proxy badges. And so now definitely we want to move into something that's opt-in um, when it's possible. So towards that, we started doing some research to find out how many people actually do opt-in. Right now, you can set a cookie. If you click on that badge, it'll take you to a page where you can say yes, no. You know, no, nev definitely never use me as a flash proxy. Or yes, go ahead and use me as a flash proxy. What we see here is that the vast majority of people don't have a yes or no preference. And that's exactly the difference between opt-in and opt-out. What do you do with the people who don't express a preference? So what we see in this graph is a few interesting things. One, there's this neat sort of daily ebb and, ebb and flow of proxy capacity, which is not that surprising because you see the same sort of patterns when you look at, for example, web server logs. The other sort of sad thing you notice is the tiny, tiny little sliver at the bottom, those are the ones who have opted in. 
So this is not too promising. And maybe it makes a little more sense if I look at um, another graph where we normalize all the heights to 1. So we can see this, the numbers who have opted in as a fraction. Looking at this, you can see we've got like 2 3% of people opted in. So kind of sad. On the other hand, maybe it's not so bad. Because it's, we're talking about 2 3% of like 10,000. So if we can get down 200, 300 proxies, that's actually enough for the number of clients we have so far. That would be enough capacity for us. So in that sense, it's very hopeful. Well, that was the graph back here. We're looking at something 100, 200 per day. Sorry? The ratio. Oh, you said you need 200 or 300. Oh, so by default, our um, proxies are configured to serve like five clients at a time. Okay. So really, you would only need 40 to serve 200 clients. So five to one ratio. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing to call out about this graph, <coughs> this lighter colored here, this lighter colored area here, those are proxies who didn't send anything for their cookie value. The way we started recording this data two weeks ago is we pushed a code change to the Flash proxy JavaScript that said, take this value of the cookie and send it to the facilitator so that we can start collecting these statistics. Badges that had the old code didn't send this cookie at all. And it's good to see this, that we see the old code pretty rapidly fall away. Within one or two days, everybody is running new Flash proxy code. So it's a nice thing that we can push this stuff out to the website. And the way do we do this is a very simple HTTP refresh that refreshes the page once a day. So at least once a day, your browser is going to check for new code. Um, and it's nice to see that it actually works. And old code basically goes away completely after a day or two. So I would like to move to an opt-in model. Um, but some of the implications are still not clear, and we need to think about them a little more. We would have enough capacity for our clients. Let me answer your question. This probably, if I understood everything, this would be answered. But uh, can you run a flash proxy while you're using flash proxies? That's a good question. He says, can you run a flash proxy while you're yourself using a flash proxy? Technically, yes. We decided that was kind of crazy and weird. So we actually disable that at the facilitator. And actually, the badge itself tries to detect if it's running in Tor and will disable itself. So we try not to let that happen. But, and we never tried it, I should say. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work, though. Yeah, I just thought it would be, be nice to opt automatically opt in, or auto, uh, just have default accept um, flash proxies if you're running flash proxy just as a peer, oh, okay. peer network thing. Yeah, yeah, I take your point. Yeah. How would the denial of service attack some kind? Yeah, that's a good question. Creation of a trillion of billions of malicious of those kinds. Right. whatever, uh, flash proxies, and make them uh, unstable and not usable, and people can give up. Yeah, no, that's a good point. This is, um, this is another thing I want to mention about opt-in. So we could definitely switch to opt-in tomorrow and be able to serve the clients we have now. One of the problems, though, is that we sort of rely on our security characteristics that these proxies should come and go. They should reflect normal internet usage, normal web usage. If all of a sudden our, pro our network is completely made of these people who have opted in and they're leaving their badges parked 24 hours a day, all of a sudden these bridges start to look blockable. They look, start to look more like normal Tor bridges. Maybe if we have enough of them, it's not a problem. So far, it's unclear, and we haven't really thought about it enough yet. You, whatever the model you choose, yeah. the bad guys now imitate your model and create those uh, coming and going. and. 5 million times more than capacity that you can handle. So 1% is going through yours. 99% is going through the North Korean flash proxies that actually don't work. Right. So that's a, actually, I think, um, I think what you're saying does tie in very much to the number of flash proxies you have. Because another yeah, potential attack, another potential attack. Let me, let me describe an attack that a sensor could do on the facilitator, for example. The sensor wants to prevent this facilitator it wants to prevent any client from receiving service. So what it can do is it can go to the facilitator and say, give me an address, and then drop it on the floor. Give me another address. Drop it on the floor. Just to try and make sure that no legit proxies actually get this client's address. Um, this attack is mitigated, one, by rate limiting, which we haven't implemented, but two, by having a large number of legit proxies. So even if we have way, way, way more than we need for capacity, the sensor has to compete with that large number. So if we have, for example, 10,000 proxies, and we're handing, them out to, we're handing each client out to, for, for example, five, pro to five proxies, the sensor needs roughly a ratio of 5 to 1. It needs to have five times as many malicious proxies in order to have a good chance of preventing clients from getting service. 
So maybe 10,000 proxies isn't enough, because you can probably think of powerful sensors who are able to muster 50,000 oh, IP addresses. Uh, I think you, throw, you, know, you have today 100. So today it's very easy to the bad guys to make it in unusable, right? Right, yeah. And they have have a, at the minute they will notice, yeah, either they do it then or you get the head, right? So when you get to a billion, yeah, you're fine. So they are not going to get there. But if they prevent it from going from 10,000 to 20,000, then you're done. You see, I'm not so sure, because even suppose they can double your capacity, they're still not going to reduce the number of legit proxies to zero. No, they're going to double. Even they're if, let's, to do let's it say that, let's 1, say they have... 1,000 times more. Okay, for example, 1,000 times more, of course, they can make it completely So unusable. people are just giving, going to give, give up on this product because it's not useful. See, I'm not so sure about that. I have a little, a little, more, a little more hope for this. Okay, One, that's fine. I think it's actually, hope is good. I think it's actually hard <laughs> for, to gain control of that many network resources. Part of this is because we have... Um, you know, this running on a lot of just legit websites and it's coming from normal internet usage. I'm not going to say it's impossible because there are a lot of powerful network players out the there. Same infrastructure, the servers, all the sensor connection, they, they can do that too. Sure, sure. The yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, of course there are weaknesses to this. Um, I don't think they're fatal weaknesses. For example, suppose the sensor actually can give 10 times the number of malicious proxies than uh, legit proxies. Um, even then, you're going to have, what is it, 9% of your clients are going to be able to get service. And if they keep trying, maybe even a higher percentage. So even then, it's still somewhat usable. And it still costs the adversary resources in order to, co to um, counteract you. So that's one of the things, again, we're doing is increasing the cost of censorship. If we're forcing them to do these kinds of attacks, we're actually winning in a way, even if it takes down this particular system. Yeah. I have sort of two unrelated questions sure. that sort of follow on to the denial of service attack. What if we up the ante and say that if I have a malicious proxy that's run by the government and I get an address of somebody who's legitimately trying to get around my sensor, I now know who's trying to get around the sensor and can go arrest the person and charge them with some crime. Right. So I now significantly up the cost of making a bad decision as to what proxy to connect to. So what you say is true. This is actually one of the possible attacks that we discuss in the research paper. Again, we're not actually <coughs> trying to protect these client addresses from anyone. We're imagining a client who already was willing to connect to Tor in order to get to the internet. In order to do that, they need to somehow go through the firewall and give up their own IP address. So basically, we look at this as an attack that's already possible, even without this system. So at least we're not making it any worse. Now, that's not totally true, just because the facilitator is sort of this database of addresses, which makes it an attractive target. So far, at current levels, the facilitator usually has zero addresses, just because they get handed out to proxies so fast. So it's not like that choice of target. But still, it is not exactly no worse. But it's not a lot worse, I think, than the normal model. Is that? The second yeah. question is, what happens if we approach this from the flip side, which is we're not really trying to make a malicious network of possible proxies, but we're making a malicious network of possible clients, Right. where we flood the facilitator with way more requests than it can actually handle. So it's right. trying to manage all of these fake clients, if you will, and trying to get them associated with proxies. That's good. Take that's up all the proxy resources. Right. That's very good. In fact, that's the other attack that we mentioned in the paper. Um, again, it's sort of a numbers game. It happens, it has to do with the number of proxies we can muster. One of the things that's not implemented yet, but we would like to do is some sort of rate limiting. So at least to increase the cost of doing this sort of attack, you would need to, in addition to controlling network resources, you would also need to control a large IP <coughs> space, which again, some sensors have. But again, we don't necessarily have to win against the ideal sensor. If we can win against sensors for real people in real countries, that's a success to me. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is a numbers game, which is why we haven't really made the decision on opt-in yet. You know, I don't know if it's really worth decreasing our proxy capacity by 95%. I don't know. We'll see. But are you planning to like distribute facilitators, or are you still going to stick with the only one facilitator model? So one facilitator or many facilitators, to me, it's about the same. The only reason to distribute it one would be some sort of load balancing if there are lots and lots and lots of requests. So far, it hasn't been an issue. The other is to perhaps distribute trust. For example, I run the facilitator that we use. You don't trust me so far, you have to deal with it. But if other people were running it, people unconnected with me or people with a different trust relationship than me, that could totally work too. I mean, there's no, there's no like architectural reason why this has to be centralized. I mean, there could in principle be more. Have you talked to any of the browser developers? 
Uh, we have talked a little bit to some browser developers, particularly about the WebRTC information. Unfortunately, haven't learned that much yet, just getting some resources and links and things. I mean, couldn't you make an argument that this is good for a user who wants privacy? Well, in what way? What do you mean? Well, this, I want privacy. Right. Okay, I want to be able to use my Safari and uh, not be tracked or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. Today, the best I get is I get a little drop down and I get to press private right. uh, browsing, which is not really. <clears throat> but that feature is obviously made available to me. Mm -hmm. What if Safari, Mosaic, you know, the Microsoft uh, Explorer thing, what if they just preloaded this stuff? So, it out. okay. It was, it was a drop down. I see what you're saying now. In fact, I haven't been involved in these discussions, but I know that people in the Tor project have been talking to browser developers in particular to make things like private browsing mode. Well, why doesn't that use Tor? Or super private browsing. Yeah, exactly. It could be an extra option or something like that. Because then you could distribute billions of images. Right. And to his point, you just completely reverse it. So this is true. Um, I know that, and I haven't been involved in these discussions, I just know that they have taken place. I think one of the objections to doing this right now is that the current Tor network wouldn't be able to handle, for example, if all Chrome users suddenly started using Tor, you know, as a side effect of using uh, private browsing. It would well, just be too many. If all Chrome users start, you, you just, that you just, if Google signs up for this, <coughs> Google's Go got tons of capacity. If Google puts it on their search page, you're done anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. So yeah, there are probably some conversations that we can make with this. Um, yeah, but that's like the fastest path to widespread adoption. Well, but as, as the Do Not Track and Internet Explorer showed, the browser manufacturers have a lot of vested interest in not giving you that much privacy. But I think they're not yeah. interested. <laughs> There are, everything there are, you do about that's okay. That's going to be fixed by putting DRM in them. <laughs> <laughs> you can have filters. Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's one of the browser's motivations to do this, to, to give you real privacy. I mean, I'd agree, too. I wish they would. Uh, you know, they haven't, and it's, the issue's been out there for a long time. Right. As in any big organization, any big or structure, there are always parts with inside that are, that are fighting at cross-purposes, and it's hard to say um, that the entity in itself has some sort of volition. But uh, I don't know. I can see it happening. Because I mean, there are people who develop browsers who do have an interest in making private browsing work and be really private. It's obviously a trend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. There's demand for it. Right. Mm. There is demand? I'm not sure there's demand. How many people uh, will give me a password if I give them a real cookie in this room? <laughs> <laughs> what kind I of don't cookie? Believe it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chocolate chip cookie from specialty bakeries. <laughs> It's a real password or a fake one. How do you know it's a real cookie? <laughs> <laughs> I don't drop dead, you get the password. <laughs> All right, moving on. I want to tell you some things that are coming up in Flash Proxy development. Some of these actually exist now, and you can start using them now. Um, and some of them are a little bit down the lines. A browser plugin. People said, hey, I like being a Flash Proxy. I don't like it using up one of my tabs all day. So someone said, OK, let's make a browser plugin. And it works. Um, you can download this, and um, I think it works for Chrome and is in development for Firefox. The developer calls it Cupcake, and it just runs in the background all the time you're using your browser. So it's as if you were looking at one of these Flash Proxy badges all the time. If you want to help out, that's one way to do it. Uh, Facebook app is another way to distribute this um, code. People could potentially share this app with their friends. This is actually in development with a group called OTI, the Open Technology Institute. I did a talk at the Chaos Communications Congress with Brian Dugan, who is one of the developers there. And um, we're really thankful to them because they applied for a prize related to Flash Proxy in the Facebook app and won us some money that we can use for development, which is really nice. Another nice thing about the Facebook app is like using this awful privacy-hating organization for a purpose other, uh, for another type of purpose. Come on, if they put it on their page, game over. Yeah. That's, that's better than the Google search page. Yeah, that's true. Because nobody ever closes their Facebook page. That's true. <laughs> Another idea behind this, 
another idea behind this is helps them overcome the yeah image greenwashing or whatever color privacy is. What color is privacy? Color is privacy. Uh, the Tor onion is green and purple. <laughs> <laughs> So another, one of the innovations of the flash proxy system is, OK, you can look at a web, web page and become a proxy. And it's super easy, and anybody can do it. Another innovation is this whole facilitator idea. And I had always regarded this facilitator as like this ugly but necessary wart in the system, just because we couldn't think of a way to get rid of it. But one of the nice things having a facilitator does for you is you can be, in effect, a proxy to the Tor network without having to be an internet server. So your home, you use your residential connection. If you want to be a Tor Relay, it again requires a little bit of know-how. You have to know how to forward ports. You have to know how to edit your Tor file to make this happen. If you could just download a program and run it, and it runs in the background all the time, it talks to the facilitator, gets clients, you're in effect adding capacity to the network. Um, you're also helping increase um, the ability of circumvention in the network. Well, that would be cool. On your so, iPhone. On your iPhone, for example. Uh, so this is another thing that is sort of in development. Um, it's mainly an idea at this point, but it would be cool to say install the Flash Proxy app, and all of a sudden you have this thing running in the background all the time. It doesn't use much bandwidth. You never worry about it. So can your iPhone tell yeah. when it's on the charger? Good question. <laughs> about being on iPhones, we actually the Flash Proxy badge actually disables itself when it thinks it's running on a mobile device, just because of reasons of bandwidth and um, like potentially paying for bandwidth and battery life. I thought it was like pretty efficient. I thought you said it's like a, just a few bytes of. No, the proxy itself is actually carrying bulk data. So if someone downloads something over Tor, that's all going through your network connection. The rendezvous step is the part that's very, very How low bandwidth. How bandwidth do you actually find running through this flash proxy? So that is something. I don't have the figures on. This is a question of how much bandwidth actually goes through the flash proxies. The way we would do that or is. Or an individual. I mean, how much, right. how much bandwidth do you need to make it worth running one? Not a lot, because people who are being censored would, sense, would settle for you know, a few tens of kilobytes. Um, naturally, we usually want more than that. But the way we would measure this is by measuring it at the bridge, uh, the WebSocket bridge that the flash proxies are connected to, this one here. I should say that the Tor project has this, frankly, astounding metric system where they measure the capacity of the network and how many people are connecting at a time and like what's the bandwidth, the estimated time to download something. And they've done a lot of research in finding ways to do this in a privacy-preserving way. So it's not like they're just keeping huge logs of IP addresses and they mainly <laughs> keep stuff in aggregate. But there is a way that you could say for a particular node in the network how much bandwidth did it push this month. So I don't have those figures, but I think I know who I could talk to to find those out. And we could find out how much bandwidth they're actually using. Yeah. Does Tor have flash proxy badges on its website? Seems like they'd be more than happy to. So does Tor have flash proxy badges on its website? It did, and then it didn't. And there's two reasons for that. It did just because, like you say, it's a good idea. And um, it's helping people out. And it's a relatively popular website. And it gets, it gets viewers. The other is that this badge is hosted at, um, one of the reasons it got taken down is because this badge is hosted at a, on a Stanford server, as it is now. You could host it yourself. But it's hosted on a Stanford server. And in principle, the Stanford server is seeing a log of everybody who is viewing these Tor pages. So but essentially, it's like a web bug. If you look into our bug tracker issues list, there's one there that says, Flash Proxy works just like a web bug which is not exactly like a web bug because there's a little bit more diffusion of trust. But still, it's a valid concern. And that's one reason they took it off. Another reason is a fairly stupid reason. And it makes me feel sad every time I think about it. It has to do just with the state of security technology on the web. If you look at our frequently asked questions, it's the second question on there. It's that the flash proxy badge actually doesn't work when it's served from an HTTPS page. And all of Tor's pages are HTTPS. And the reasons behind that are technical and stupid. And again, it makes me sad every time I think about it. But um, I'll be happy to talk about you with that afterwards to explain why that is the case. And we're also trying to research ways to combine flash proxy with ops proxy or other types of fingerprinting resistance. So the idea here is you take your bytes, you push them through ops proxy. Ops proxy talks to flash proxy. And then you go out through a browser. So someone looking at the connection 
Well, they can see its WebSocket, but inside that it looks like a random stream. So it makes it harder to fingerprint um, than we have now. This is kind of, this is awesome as soon as we can get this. This is something we're actively working on now. And if we have standalone bridges that aren't tied to a web browser, well, we're not necessarily limited to WebSocket because we have sockets. Uh, we can get rid of the WebSocket overhead. If you don't know, WebSocket connection starts with an HTTP request, fairly fingerprintable. Every frame you send in WebSocket comes with a little header, again, fairly fingerprintable. So if a sensor wanted to block flash proxy and they didn't care about collateral damage, one of the things they could do is block WebSocket. And that ability goes away if we have standalone proxies using normal sockets. But, but you said you sort of depended on these proxies coming and going to... <laughs> yes, that's a good point. So we're losing some of um, our ability to uh, claim that it's hard to block all these addresses. So they're not coming and going. On the other hand, it gives us bigger numbers overall. And maybe numbers is another thing that's hard to block. I mean, every IP address you're blocking has to go in a firewall rule set somewhere. And then those rule sets somehow have to get distributed across the national firewall or whatever it is. So again, it's not trivial. So we're making the problem harder. And this is something, again, even though it doesn't have the nice um, traffic characteristics that a web browser does, it's still something I would like to see implemented. Oh, and by the way, the numbers on here are, are Tor bug numbers. If you find these notes later on, you can click on these and see the discussion we've been having event about each of these issues. All right, so say you're sold on flash proxies and you want to help. One of the things you can do is install the badge on your web page. You just copy and paste this HTML, and the badge will appear wherever you put it. And if you get sick of it, you can remove it later. We also have a way that you can force all your badges to be opt-in only. So if that's an issue for you, you say, OK, all my users, I only want the ones who have opted in to do it. Um, you can just, you just pass a query parameter at the end of this, and it will force it to be an opt-in only badge. There's instructions for that on our demo page. <coughs> Another thing you can do is go find one of these badges, again, like on our demo page at the beginning of the presentation. Click on the badge, and it will bring up a little option that says yes, no. And if you like supporting the project, you click yes, and all that does is set a cookie. That means when we do switch to the opt-in model, you'll continue to be a proxy. But that's a, that's a cookie, so if you're clearing your cookies, that'll go away. That'll go away, that's right. Not if you used ever cookies. <laughs> Yeah, we could use EverCookies. On the other hand, we're an anonymity system. <laughs> uh, you can install Cupcake on your, um, in your browser, and then you don't have to worry about the cookie thing because it'll take care of that. Another cool idea, which I never thought of, which, which is an awesome idea, was contributed by a fella we know as Satya. He sent, it's one line of code. It's one line of JavaScript. You go into your Wikipedia configuration if you have an account for editing. You say, edit my accounts, you go find this one place, you paste, in the, you paste in the JavaScript, and it'll put a badge on your Wikipedia. So if you're the kind of person who has a Wikipedia tab open all day, um, which is like everybody, then you get to be a flash proxy all day. So I thought that was a really clever idea, and it's one simple thing you can do to help out this system. And then this here, again, I can, point, I can talk to you afterwards if you want to look at this. This is a link to the bug tracker, all the bugs and open, chas and open tasks that exist. Thankfully, we've got more open tasks than bugs. We don't get a lot of bug reports. Uh, but there are a lot of things that need to be done. We need good hackers. We have good hackers. We need more. So if you're interested in helping out, come talk to me afterwards or send me an email. I'd be more than happy to talk you through some of the issues that still need work. And uh, we'll find something for you to work on. Wouldn't it just be cheaper and easier to spend 100 bucks Russian and have it distributed as malware? <laughs> <laughs> because I understand I can buy a program running on 50,000 computers for order 100 bucks. So I, I spend, think that's very true. <laughs> so I spend a little more than that, and I dwarf your network with a lot less money and time. Right. And I don't have to take my attention away from whatever stupid things I'm doing with my computer. That's true. So yeah, one way, that is one way to build, I mean, well, basically you buy a botnet and you can do a lot of things with a botnet. Uh, Since everybody's in four botnets anyway, so. <laughs> right. So originally one of the ideas we had for this when we were brainstorming this as a research idea is, well, we have Adobe Flash running, why don't we buy ads that are Flash, animated Flash ads? And then that would run this program. 
And it's easy to get just an ad distributed. It's not even like malware. It's just ads that show up on tons and tons of web pages. That would be one distribution strategy. Um, we don't do that. I mean, that's like a little too gray um, for what we're doing. But I mean, again, you can think of it as a research idea. Tell you the Tor project is probably not going to be paying <laughs> for Russian botnets in order to distribute their <laughs> software. You're right. The Ukrainians are better. I, I'm not. A, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not speaking officially on that. But <laughs> all right. Finally, source code. Uh, a clever man told me once: if it's not free software, then it sucks. Of course, probably the people in this audience know when I say free software, I mean free speech not free beer software. He was talking specifically about anonymity and circumvention systems. Um, I believe in this sentiment generally, but particularly with censorship, um, circumvention, and anonymity systems. If you can't see the source code, that's a security risk. If you don't know if there's a backdoor that the implementer put in there, that's bad for you. If you can't verify that there aren't security bugs that the sensor is going to exploit against you, that's bad for you. Basically, access to the source code is a security requirement for software like this, in my opinion. And so naturally, everything we release is, in, is free software. Every, every bit of code that we write, you can download and audit, look at yourself, hopefully improve, send us some patches. And you can also browse through uh, all the code online. So this card says, thank the nice people for their time and attention. Thank you, nice people, for your time and attention. <laughs> And it's the last card, so that means it's time for questions. Oh, let's you mentioned earlier that you did a download test where you had proxies failing every 10 seconds. Right. And you made sure that it worked. What was the uh, throughput on that, just out of curiosity? So our figures for that are in the paper. I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, find me afterward because I actually have a video we made of doing this test where we have two browsers set up in parallel. The, the proxy would die in one and come up in the other and then die in this one and come up in this one. And you can see the progress of the download and it'll stop. And then it has to restart the download, of course. There's a little bit of a delay, but you can actually see how it works. So I don't have that off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to show you. It's something, it's like less than 50% of the bandwidth you get. So it's pretty miserable, but you can still get your download finished. So the facilitator public key, that's distributed with the browser bundle or with the right. class proxy bundle? Right. We distribute the public key with um, the software that we distribute. Have you seen in the wild any bogus facilitators? So have we seen any bogus facilitators in the wild? Um, no. It's not clear how that would work. I mean, you can think about someone taking the flash proxy code and just modifying it to do something else. But there are limited ways that you can make an attack like that work. Because eventually, you have to connect to the censored user. And that censored user is going to be using Tor. This is, again, one of the reasons why we use Tor. You get these security guarantees. If that Tor connection, that's authenticated. They're going to be expecting to connect to a Tor bridge. If they're not connected there, it's not going to work. There's no way you can somehow reveal their traffic by doing that. The connection is just going to die if you don't connect them where they're so supposed to go. Facilitator, the connection comes in to a fake, I can make my own Tor node. Sure. So I do, a man, I do a Tor node in the middle instead of the flash proxy, and I force, and I, and I come in the other way. So I, I, I present myself as a false flash proxy. Sure, no, that's absolutely true. A false proxy spoofer that's running to a, to a fake Tor network. We can imagine all these things being controlled by an adversary. So yeah. for example, let's say we have a uh, malicious flash proxy and, and malicious, a malicious and malicious facilitator and a malicious torn out and say a malicious facilitator well what can go wrong the client can communicate with the facilitator the facilitator still has to kind of play ball i mean it has to give this address um, somehow it could just send these addresses into a black hole but the client is going to figure that out sooner yeah. or later the flash proxy well we suspect they're going to do something with the client and connect to there it can even control this own its own tor relay but again, anybody can run a Tor relay anyway. So this isn't like a new attack that's specific to Flash Proxy. This is something you can do anyway. Your abilities when running a Tor relay, an entry relay, or um, any yeah, kind but, of relay. But I've now identified the client. 
Yes, that's true. So you've now identified the client. Right. So yeah, you can run a facilitator. Um, for example, suppose um, they hijack DNS or something and they start taking over our facilitator. Well, now you're identifying clients. So I admit this is sort of a concern, but also it's the same thing where we're expecting the client to divulge their IP address anyway. We're assuming that the client, if they could, would dispense with all of this and connect directly to the Tor relay. And in that case, the sensor gets the client's IP address anyway. Admittedly, perhaps not as straightforwardly because you have to look at it within a sea of other traffic and you can't just look at traffic from um, to or from one particular host. So it makes the attack a little bit better, but it's still an attack that existed before. And again, controlling a Tor relay doesn't buy you that much because there's still the onion encryption. You can undo one level of encryption, but still the client decides what is the next node that it's going to connect to. And there's no way for you to subvert that unless Tor itself is broken. Very good. Cool. Thank you very much. And now all the cool stuff. <laughs>